As uh, many of you know, my name is Rob Cookfield. I'm the executive director here. And this is our second lecture in our winter lecture series, all about people and trades of London Town. If you missed last week's lecture, it is on our YouTube channel. Kyle Dalton, who is a public programs administrator here, gave a presentation about the sailors and captains, so the mariners of London Town. That, as I said, is on our YouTube channel. So it works out well that today our presentation is about building wooden ships. We had shipwrights here in London town, and so Andy Shaw will be the one talking about how those folks would have built wooden vessels, as well as showing how modern people today try to keep these um, holes in the water filled with <coughs> afloat in some way. Uh, next week is me talking about William Brown and the carpenter shop, and the week after that, Ryan Cox from the Maryland State Archives is going to be talking about the enslaved Africans in the colony of Chesapeake and their experience. What we're also going to try with that last one, if we can get it arranged, is we're going to try to live stream it as a Google Hangout for those folks that are at home and can't quite make it. So we'll have information about that, hopefully, more in detail next week. The audience for that, maybe you all, but there's a lot of other museum folks that are really interested in that lecture that can't make it here. So we're going to try that. So I'm really happy that Andy is here. He most recently worked at Historic St. Mary City, where he was the bosun for the Maryland Dove, which is a recreated vessel from the early part of the 1600s. He was also involved with the reconstruction of the Sultana, and no, Coward Nico, I'm sorry. Bigger ship, though, so much more impressive. Uh, if you haven't seen the Coward Nico, I encourage you to see it. But Andy worked at St. Mary's City for over a decade, keeping this wooden boat, the Maryland Dove, afloat. It was already 30 years old, give or take. 20. 20. I'm trying to make it sound. <laughs> Very humble guy over here. But a 20-year-old vessel that's made out of wood, keeping that thing afloat is no mean feat, because wood and the river and everything in between really wants it to rot. So since I'm apparently doing a good bad job at telling you what Andy's job is, I'm going to turn it over to him. You can see he is the expert, and that's why he's here. There you go. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Um, first, I'll let you know a little bit of background. How do you end up being a shipwright in the 20th and 21st century? Well, as a young man, I, I started sailing when I was about 18. Long about 1994, I was in the market for a new boat, and I made the somewhat questionable decision of buying a boat that was made out of this material that they call wood. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I soon learned that in addition to sailing the boat, I also liked working on it. So I got up, studied more about it. I spent a couple summers in Maine, taking some classes up at the, the wood boat school there, just kind of learning the basics. It's it's enough to really make your head spin when you're first learning it. Cause you're used to looking at straight lines and things that do this and that, and you got to make all these shapes that are um, quite odd out of a material that really doesn't want to move. So I spent a couple summers up there, and right about that same time, the Calmar Nickel, which Rob mentioned, was being built in Wilmington, and I happened to be living in Wilmington, so I mustered up the courage to uh, walk down to the shipyard and ask for a job. The first thing he said to me was, well, gosh, I just hired somebody yesterday. <laughs> So we proceeded to walk around the ship and talk for about 20 or 30 minutes and by the time we were done talking he said, well can you start tomorrow? So I apparently learned enough of the talk to get my foot in the door there and that's how I started on this line of work that I've been in for almost 20 years. Uh, I recently left the Stark St. Mary City and now I have my own business doing custom woodworking and I'm sure I'll be doing some shipwright work um, in the future. I was just doing some consulting recently. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the Calmar Nickel, which is not a new ship anymore, I'm realizing. She's actually about 18 years old now. So she's starting to have some of the same issues that I discovered when I got to the Dove. But we're going to start with a little bit of new construction. When you think of a tall ship, you probably think of something like this, right? But what comes to my mind is something more like this. <laughs> This is somewhat early on in the days of Calmar Nickel. This is inside the ship. I, I always call this picture the belly of the beast. 
So most of the framing is up at this point, and it's all quite massive. She's, a, she's actually a much larger vessel than the Dell that I worked on recently. So here you've got the, uh, this is actually the keel sun, which is kind of the inner keel. And of course the frame is also known sometimes as ribs. This odd looking piece here is actually a large pattern. Whenever you're making stuff out of these big pieces of very expensive lumber, you want to make all your mistakes on an inexpensive pattern, and you call the fine fitting, and then you can transfer that information to the big lumber. So that's the inside of the, sh the ship at that point. And this is her about, I'd say, a third of the way along in framing it. And the way it's framed is you, you've taken a set of plans and you've brought them up to full size on a lofting floor, which is like a small gymnasium floor where you can actually make these full size patterns or full size information. And then the frames are built laying down flat. And when they're assembled, they're stood up and then braced diagonally just to keep everything in line. And the frames are actually built up of futtocks, which are kind of like masonry. You've got a piece here, and then it's staggered, and then it's staggered. And that's how you get from the keel all the way up to the, to the top. So. This picture is her pretty much all framed up, kind of hiding behind a lot of scaffolding. You can get you can get some feeling of the mass of the ship. And these uh, these these derricks that you see were actually used with block and tackles, very traditional primitive technology, which we used to get large timbers up into the ship that couldn't be carried. And frankly, most of the timbers that went into this ship couldn't be carried by hand, at least not by more than several people. So rather than having a crane on site, we just used these derricks. And they work beautifully. There's uh, three of them, two of them on the starboard side, I think, and one on the port side. So what we're looking at here is the stern of the vessel, which is the higher end. And then down here is the bow. <clears throat> here's a side view. And here's me to give you a little bit of scale on the ship. And you have a lot of material sitting around waiting to be put into it. The stern and the transom are up here. And then the bow is up here. And this is started to be framed in with the frames that are not uh, one-piece frames, what they call camp frames. And they're going to slide into this. Uh, what's, what's been done here is we build a mold, basically, that those frames are going to be fitted into, and it's going to hold them in place until a more permanent structure holds everything together. The piece uh, sticking out in front is called the long head, and above that will be installed the beacon, which is a working area for working some of the sails. So this is kind of very early getting the bones in the boat stage of the ship building. <clears throat> this is that kind of same period shot straight from the bow. You can see the camp frames here, 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 and here are kind of coming out like a set of hands. And uh, that's me in the picture. This is my one tiny little claim to fame. This picture was actually in a wooden boat magazine. And uh, the tree on the top is traditionally put up uh, to signify the ship as somewhat of a living thing. And it's also mm -hmm. supposed to bring good luck. <coughs> this is inside looking forward, basically the reverse view of what we saw earlier. And you can see all the heavy, the heavy framing and again another pattern there. Now what's going on here is the inside of the ship is starting to be put together. The inside planking is called ceiling planking. Unlike being overhead, it's there because it seals up the inside of the ship. It's going to protect the bilges, which are the lowest part of the ship from the cargo and whatever's in there. And it also makes the ship a lot stronger. Sometimes ships start built with very little or no ceiling planking, like the Maryland Dove, which I worked on. And she has a large section that does not have the ceiling planking. I think it has advantages and disadvantages. It's got the advantage of you can, get, you can keep an eye on things better, and the ventilation is better. The disadvantage is the ship is not as strong. So most of it is just a standard planking, and then these ones here you may notice are a little bit bigger, and there's a scarf joint here, and those are called the bilge stringers. And it's all just part of what's going to make the ship really very strong. Would you mind mentioning the type of wood? Oh, sure. This, this uh, vessel was built of a lot of uh, tropical hardwood. She's got a lot of purple hardwood in her, a lot of corderail, which is a South American variety of the locust tree. And then the top sides, the decks, and the um, framing for all that is typically, in this vessel it was Douglas fir. You'll typically use the lighter woods, the higher up you go in the 
the ship because you want as little weight as possible up there. Now the Dove, which I'm going to get to in a bit, she was all domestic, almost all white oak and, and uh, pine, probably not all the pine. But Panama was built mostly with tropicals, with the exception of the Dove fir, which we'll be seeing soon in a minute. Here's the Douglas fir. As I said, the wood is kind of large. When it's, it's funny, when I look at this picture on a small scale, and I glance at the uh, at that, it looks like it's a big cardboard box, but that's actually a piece of fur that's probably 12 inches thick and about four feet wide. And what you see here, these curved timbers, they're the deck beams. So that's going to form the substructure of the deck. And the reason they're curved is to shed the water as opposed to having it gathered in places, which is where the rod will start. So in the background here, you might see this, this piece here. That's a, a cutting jig, a pattern that we use to cut these out. So that gets set on top. And in addition to cutting the curve that you've done, there's very few straight lines and square corners on the ship. So there's also going to be an angle cut. It'll be subtle, but it'll be there. And that's going to form the shear of the ship. And that's what makes the boat pretty. It's the fact that it swoops down in the middle. So in addition to cutting this curve into these timbers, we're also cutting a bevel or an angle on them. And this was cut with one of the loudest machines I've ever heard. It's a, a chainsaw mill, which is basically a chainsaw with a guide bar with two engines. And you didn't want to be anywhere near it unless you had really good hearing protection. So these are the deck beams getting, uh, getting their initial cutting loops. And here you can see that beams in place, you know, going clear across, and you can start to see some of the other substructure of the deck. And again, this is all that does for the somewhat lighter weight moves for the upper framing. The fore and aft timbers that you see going this way are called carlins or carlings, depending on who you talk to. And something that's also predominant in this picture are these corner brackets, which are called knees. These particular knees are called lodging knees, and they're the ones that are mounted basically horizontally. And the reason that you're seeing so much, so many knees here is because this is where the main mist is going to come through the deck right here. So there's going to be a whole lot of stress on the deck at this point. So anywhere you have a mass coming through, it's braced very, very heavily. And this is just an overview. Up in the bow there, you can see we've actually filled in between the cant frames and the stem with what's called night heading. And it's basically you fill that in completely solid because that area takes a lot of stress in a pounding seed. And it just helps keep things sturdy and strong and, and hopefully watertight. So that's a very, it's very, it's part of the ship that gets a lot of stress. So you want to build it extremely strong. Now these are the raw materials for the knees that we were looking at. And here I have actually, this is a slice off from one of these, it might be one of these pictures, but the reason you use wood like this is this is actually made of hack attack, which is another word for a large tree, and it grows down in swamps. And what this is, is where the root of the tree is going up into the trunk. So the grain, instead of being a straight grain, the grain is actually growing around the corner, and that's what makes them extremely strong. So they'll typically may be made of um, live oak, which grows down south, also grows in lots of fun curvy shapes, was also a good candidate for making knees and, and braces like that. So having that grain that goes around the corner makes it for a very strong, naturally grown angle bracket. And this next picture, you'll see some hanging knees up above here. You can see that I've aged a little since I worked on that. <laughs> so. So you've got hanging knees, which come from above, the lodging knees, which are basically horizontal, and just barely in view here for that windless bit is what's called a, a standing knee. And a standing knee is basically the opposite of a hanging knee. So that's transferring the weight, the load that's on this uh, mooring bit that's getting pulled forward on it transfers that load down to the deck frame. So again, everything just really, really strong. You're not you're not building a house that's going to sit there. You're going to build something and you're going to throw it in the water and it's going to get tossed around for many, many years. So you don't really 
You don't really want to skip. This is a shot I got when somebody brought a high lift to the yard one day. I didn't really have this perspective. So here you can see some of the deck beams going in on the raised uh, focal deck, which is the upper four deck, and the back, the quarter deck. And then the main deck is actually down below some of this scaffolding. Uh, they start to see some of these pieces of the puzzle that we've been seeing actually come into their place. And we're going to fast forward to just a little bit before lunch. She's been all planked up. We've reached a point that uh, if anybody works in nonprofits and you do fundraising, you kind of have to get to some milestones. So you kind of reach a point where let's get her in the water, make people really believe that we have ship this, you know, going to sail and going to float. So all the bottom planking has been done, all the caulking has been done, pretty much every, anything that needs to be done within a reasonable distance from the water line has been finished. So we actually launched her on ways. They used to slide them down basically two big large timbers and they grease them up and she'd slide into the water. We actually used rollers, but you know, rather than picking her up with a crane, it was pretty cool to see her literally slide down into the water that day. And I was actually on board. It was a, it was a great experience. So this is the stern view. You can see that um, in addition to uh, having all the caulking and having her sealed up, um, since we are in the 20th century and we need to maintain a schedule, but she does have engines. So of course, all that, at least getting the props and shafts in, that had been done. So this was in September of 1997. And I worked on her until April of the next year, which is when she was finally commissioned. So there was still quite a bit of work to be done, but uh, it was nice to see her float. So, it was an experience. So, Leaving there, a job became available on this ship, which some of you may be familiar with. This is a dove from down at St. Mary's. Uh, this sounds fun. There's some sailing involved. There will be some woodworking. And it's a little bit smaller. It seems a little more manageable. It's actually probably about a third the size of the tower. It's a very good vessel. But she's very similar. Same time period, um, same style of rig, same style of hull. It's known as a pinnace, which means it just has a single deck going below the water and there's not multiple levels. It's basically just a cargo hold and some living space. So I thought, oh, this sounds like fun. But then I quickly learned that this is not a new boat and this is the kind of thing you find on it. So I thought, what did I get myself into here? So I found stuff like this pretty much within my first week of work. But I pushed on it and uh, over the 16 years that I worked there, we did some extensive restoration work with the help of a lot of volunteers. My friend Dick Crespin who was here today and Carolyn Corbin who was one of my apprentices in the apprentice program that we started there. And that was one of my favorite things was having that, that program going being able to teach some of these skills to people who were interested in, you know, try to keep them alive, try to pass it on. So what I'm going to cover here will be a lot of the same type of skills involved in shipbuilding. It's just that we're having to take it apart and put it back together again. And what I've been saying about having to build it so strong doesn't come apart real easily. <laughs> so this was, I think, about two years into the job, I discovered an ex extensive amount of rot on the starter quarter. And here, I'm again probably thinking, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> so we tore out all this planking. And we had to replace some section of frames because you can you can see the framing from the inside and, and it looks fine, right? Good solid wood, old but solid. This is what you get in the inside. So this is what we we're in for. My friend John Swain. Can you pull that up? Yeah. The uh, the builder of the Sultana calls calls this hatting because it's like a hat. It's, solid on three sides and, and hollow on the other side. So I've actually hung around with this piece of wood for several years as a reminder and it makes for a good visual aid. And it's, it's probably from somewhere right in this picture because I know it's from this era. She was actually built with a lot of iron fastenings, which is not necessarily a good thing back in 17th and 18th century. They were using a lot of trawls, a lot of wooden pegs. Trawl comes from the word tree nail, just like you're using a timber frame. And the nice thing about trawls is they don't have a rot. So in a lot of the restoration work we've done, we actually switched over 
and started using trunnels. And the trunnels, the trunnels are traditionally made out of amogus, which if you're familiar with it, it's very hard and it's also very drought resistant. What I'm doing in this picture is I'm taking some flitches. For shipbuilding, you don't you don't buy straight boards because you don't need a lot of straight boards unless you're laying the deck. So what you do is you have the sawmill slice the wood just right along the log. It's best to actually go and look at the log and say, okay, see that curve there? I want to keep that. And you can just barely make out that I've actually got a, a small pattern on there. And what I'm almost certainly doing <coughs> is making one of these products, one of these pieces that's going to build up the frame. So this is actually a, a small flitch of, this is actually Osage Orange, which we used on another project, but you can see, you take advantage of keeping that curve in the grain. And Osage is also a very good, hard, very rock-resistant wood. The Sultana that was built over in um, Chestertown, she's framed um, pretty much all Osage Orange. And a little later on, we're going to talk about Osage some more. This is white oak that I'm working with here. The dove was built originally with pretty much all white oak and pine. And so here we've got some of the frames in place. This is a new one. This is a new one. Some of them weren't quite bad enough that we needed to replace the whole thing. There was enough structural integrity that you just kind of dig out the rot and put in what's called a Dutch bin or a grading piece. So looks like we're closing in. And then it'll be time to start planking. Before you can start planking, again, you're not building a house or a box, you're building a lot of curves. You've got to figure out where all those lines are going to be. So since we've opened up a section that's about five or six feet from top to bottom, and we've got, I think it was seven runs of planking to go in, you're going to divide that evenly at each frame, and that'll give you a pretty good idea of how to make them even, but they're going to taper as they go aft because the shape of the ship changes. So you lay those marks out, but then you take a batten, it's a long, skinny, flexible piece of wood. And you can see us both kind of looking down at just making sure those lines are what we call fair. Fair means not a straight line, but a line that doesn't have any bumps or hollows in it. And you do that in order to make sure these planks are all going to fit tightly together and keep the water up. Um, here you can see we've got a long batten running along here. So here we're continuing that layout process. And from then you move on to making the planks. So you're going to make a pattern for each one of these to capture that curve of the ship. I think uh, frequently people think that you just you steam all that shape into the You actually don't. You steam the shape that goes around the hull, but the shape that's going horizontally, you're actually going to cut that into the wood. So this is part of that process here. That process is called spiling. And there are several tools that you use. You, you lay on a pattern onto the ship, and then you it's pretty similar to scribing as far as catching the shape. This, uh, this tool here is called a spiling block. And you use that on your pattern to transfer at every station. And then you will also use a double gauge. Because where each plank touches another plank, again, if you do square and straight stuff, you're building a box. So not only is it not straight, but the angle is going to roll and change as it goes from the one end to the other. It's not going to have this angle all the way along, except possibly a niche that may start here. And then usually just an increment of time, it's just going to change and get a little bit different. So you've got to record all that information onto your pattern and then transfer it to the board. So here you can actually you can see the, the subtle curvature of the planks, and it looks like we've gotten about two-thirds of the way down here. And the planks, of course, are not big enough to run the whole length of the ship, so you'll have uh, butt joints, or the joints are butt up against one another. That's an original plank that we were actually able to keep and work around it. And then the way we bent them in in this particular process was using a modern version of the block and tackle, we were able to run them long and then attach them to the rudder where you could get some mechanical advantage on them and really pull them in. And you're not pulling just around the shape that you're frequently having to twist them as well. So what we would do if, if we had a lot of twist to put in, you clamp a lever on this so you could pull from just below it, and that would pull the twist in. So 
So fast forward to actually many years later, but just below the area we're just looking at was up here. And this newly planked area that you're seeing here was, was about three or four years ago, I think. Yeah, Mr. Preston, you can see was on that project. So again, more rock in the same area, farther down. So like Rob was saying, just trying to keep an old boat alive. But there you can kind of see how the, you know, the curves are subtle. But um, down when you get to this plank, there's actually, that's when the shape of the ship really changes a lot. And that plank looked just about like a propeller. I, I tried very hard to get a picture that would really allow you to see how much change in the shape was, but none of the pictures ever really captured it. Uh, another project that involves being able to capture that shape are these channels that the rigging runs through. And when they're in place, they just look like you slap the board on the side of the ship. It doesn't look like that much work. It was actually one of the more complex things I did because you had to conform where it connects to the ship. It's got one angle here, and like I was just talking about with the planking, it's got another angle here. If you're lucky and you work in a big shipyard, you can use a ship saw for this. So if you look at the angle here, you can see that it kind of rolls to a more severe angle here. And traditionally, those lines would be marked off, and you would dub it down with an as, which is this tool you may be familiar with. You just keep working along until you get down to those lines, and then you would finish it up with finer tools like planes. Uh, this day and age, if you're lucky enough to be in a full-scale shipyard, you'll have one of these. This, what this is is a very large bandsaw that's called a ship saw. But the cool thing about it is you can tilt the blade. See this trimming here? And not only can you tilt the blade, you can tilt the blade while the saw is running. So you can take that shape that you needed to make, and you can start with that angle. And you'll have, if you're cutting very big stuff, it usually takes a gang of guys to push it through. So you have one guy who's the driver, he's watching the line. And then you'll have different degrees marked on it at different stages. And there's another guy who's running the tilt of the blade, and he's going to change that tilt as it rolls through. It doesn't get it perfect, but it gets it a lot closer in a lot less time than using an ass. So it's, it's quite complex, it's huge shaking your head. <laughs> if you can't do that, what I had to do with this channel, this is a channel that's located further forward on the ship where there's a lot more curve to it. And not only a lot more curve, but a lot more twist. So what I did, and this is actually much more traditional to say doing it with the ads, is I laid out the line, which starts you know, pretty wide there. And this is going down to nothing on the other side and then it gets skinnier up here. So I, what I did is I took a saw and just cut slots, cut curves, and then knocked out those chunks, probably with a chisel or, or an adze, and then went on to uh, planes to finish that with. So this, this was more than I could do with any of the tools that we had that were actually modern, so we had to go about it full-on traditional, so, which is kind of fun. I like the mixture of it. It's, I don't really want to have to start sawing 20-foot long planks, but I really enjoy the handwork, working with chisels and planes and mallets and things. And it's nice that some of it has to be done that way. And typically when I am working with the modern tools, I'm almost always finishing with a hand tool of some sort. So this is another channel that's got to have all that twist into it. And this is that one we looked at a minute ago. So this, this is in place. And like I've always said on my job, and then somebody's going to come along and paint that, and it's going to look like we didn't do anything at all. <laughs> Because part of our job was to keep things looking the same. So if you're lucky enough to get there when we're working on it, and I always thought that was an interesting facet of working at the museum, was being able to have things kind of cracked open and fixing them in basically the traditional, the methods of traditional, the tools have improved. But being that we were also a living history museum, we did pretty much strict, strictly stick to uh, hand tools during open hours. But from an efficiency standpoint, it was not going to, it's not going to add up right to do everything the old way. It would be nice to, but uh, I don't think they could ever afford it. <laughs> Plus, there was so much work that needed to be done. So another aspect of shipbuilding is building the rudder of the ship. And if you're not familiar with what a rudder is, it's kind of a fishtail on the back of the ship that steers it. Long about 10 years ago, I think, the rudder on the Dove started to rot out of the water line. 
it was a big piece of timber. It wasn't too bad yet, so we were able to get a uh, tree from, that came down, I think it was in, what's the second one, Hurricane Ernesto, that came down in the woods on the museum property, and I just started. Whenever we had a big storm, we'd go out in the woods and look for lumber. And fortunately, there were local sawmills that could cut it. So we found a very large timber that was going to suffice for the, uh, for the main log of this butter and a smaller tree that I got the extra pieces that build up the blade. Got them cut, let them sit for about five years. Could have gone longer, but the original writer was then really starting to look a little iffy. So we actually started this project in the fall and then able to do it on site so visitors could see it happening. So what, what's going on here is you've got the main rudder log, which, which actually I did have the slider cut a little bit of taper into. We went back and had it re because as it had sat for five years, it had just, just the slightest twist in it which if I had spent a few weeks on it, I could have gotten out myself, but we decided it was more and efficient to take it up and get it slightly re -sung. But From there on out, um, it was a lot of hand work. So you've got that piece and then a fat piece there, and they get slightly smaller as they go up. So what you're looking at, I don't have a good end view, this is like a stairway. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn the stairway into a sliding board. So we need to knock off those notches and we're going to make flat blade out, a tapered flat blade out of it. This is Mr. Preston and I driving in 30 inch long drift pins, 30 inch long uh, iron rods that pin all these pieces together. These lines that you see up and down are saw curves. So what we did was we made a jig that ran up a hill with a taper. And what that did is it gave us the depth that we were going to aim for. And from there, we actually were doing it by hand with the uh, shipwright's axis. And we made a lot of chips. This is Rebecca Crasher, who was another one of my apprentices several years back. And again, it was really nice to be able to do this on site at the museum and have the visitors see it. And some of them were even brave enough to try it. So this is just another, another view of that same. You can see that the, the chips are piling up. Since we had put it together rough, we also had to cut it. And of course, the, the tool of choice was the, the two-man crosscut saw, which will make you feel very, very early. So we laid out our line, and um, I don't remember how long it took us, but we managed to get through it, and that gave us the basic shape of our rudder. You notice it looks different shades and different pictures. At the end of each day, in order to keep the wood from drying out too much, we would put a coat of oil on it. Just, the, the faster it dries out, the more it's going to develop those checks or those cracks that you see along the way. So at the end of every workday, we would wipe on a coat of uh, thin down and see the wall. And then come back at it the next day, of course, then that would all go away again. Here I decided to forgo many, many days or weeks with the hand plane and a lot of power plane to go for the finishing. But you can really see how it's starting to take shape, where what we had before that was kind of like zigzag, like stairway. It's really starting to look like a nice smooth blade. And this is putting a little shape into the upper part of it. I decided to go somewhere between really plain and really fancy, so I developed this pattern. I scribed it onto the wood, and again, I used that technique where you go in with a handsaw and you cut down to that line. And what I'm doing here, you can see a little closer, is I'm chiseling down to, the, to this line that I've established, and I also have put a little bit of a so the saw curves didn't go all the way across, they kind of went across in the arm. So that's being all brought down by hand. And nice to do the finishing with the hand tools, but nice to have some of the tools for, so you're not there for six months. So here she is, not quite finished, but just about ready to uh, head to the boat yard. Uh, you can see by this picture that the ship has already gone to the yard for winter storage. So we put the rod on the truck and took it over. But there was still some shaping to be done. You're putting this, what's called a chamfer on the front, the leading edge so that it sheds the water more evenly. And these notches here are going to receive the hardware, uh, pickles and gun pins that hold the rudder and make it turn. They're basically the hinges for the rudder. So they're going to get led into these dados here. And again, it's a mixture of handwork and handwork. work. You can see all the, there's four sets of uh, <coughs> Pencils for this, so you can see cut out for all the straps. These little spots you see here and here, are, they were just either small soft spots or small knots 
that we just let's go ahead and grab them out and put one of those stuff in.
just working carefully, you just pay attention to not go down too far. You're looking to get this again all symmetrical. And then once we get the eight siding done, I'm sorry, the 16 siding done, we basically do the same thing again using that same technique with the, the tar stain. And here we're bringing it down to 32 size. And from there, it's just most of the smaller sparks I've done, then it's just you kind of just go by feel and you're just getting rid of the ridges. And it literally is sometimes you can almost do it with your eyes closed. You just run your hand down and know there's a little high spot there. You can do it with flat planes. There are also, I have a spark plane. A spark plane would be, instead of it being flat on the bottom, it's going to be concave. That's just a little run on spar making. I think I've done. This is a shot of me making a much smaller spar. This is Flagstaff. And again, you can see the brown knife in action. And this is actually up in Baltimore at the Brown Tradition Soap Life Festival. I did a, an apprentice program for them for a, for a grant to teach spar making to one of, my, uh, one of my apprentices. So he learned the whole process. He actually built a Flagstaff for the Maryland Dove. And they were having their 10th anniversary of this apprenticeship program, so they started having a folk life festival in Baltimore, and they invited us up. And I think I did it three years running, they invited us up, we went up with a blank stock, we left a pile of shavings on the street, and we went home with a finished bar. So it was, it was a lot of fun, and it was real fun to be able to demonstrate. Uh, Carolyn actually was my apprentice for, I think, the last festival I did. So I guess, uh, shot of the draw knife, and then this is just putting a little bit of <clears throat> detail on the bottom again, using using the mallet and chisel. We have time for more? Yes. Okay. This is another restoration project, and this might be something that, I know Rod actually wants to get this boat up here. This is the, <coughs> the larger of the two ships boats at the Maryland Dove, and this is kind of what we started with. This boat was, I think about 33, 34 years old at the time. And early on in its tenure, somebody had caulked it too tight. And what happens when you caulk a boat too tight, the caulking is what goes in between the seams. Then the wood swells when it gets in the water, and the planks will buckle. And particularly this plank, you can see it buckles severely. And what happened was the planks buckled so much that it broke 80% of the frames on the boat. Uh, this is a broken frame here. So the initial repair, which lasted, I think, over 20 years, was to do what's called sistering, which is putting in a second frame alongside. And you'll actually see this done in houses. If you've had termite damage, they'll just lay in, after they, after they poison the floor joist, they'll just lay in a second joist alongside of it to take the strain. And you're basically doing the same thing here. You're putting in another frame alongside to keep the strength, since you have all these broken frames. So that was done, and it really lasted quite a while, but the boat was just getting really soft and kind of unstable, and frankly, a little bit unsafe. We were afraid to take it very far. So we, we embarked on this journey to do a fairly substantial rebuild. Uh, Mr. Preston here was my main assistant on this job. So we started by removing three strikes of planking, this one, this one, and this one, down both sides of the boat. And the nice thing about those sister frames being in there that were the temporary repair was they preserved the shape enough for us. So I left them in as, as a mold, basically, to keep the shape. And I'm talking to one of my colleagues at Talbot Marine Museum, George Surgeon, he's the boat right there. Since the structure was so compromised, he recommended using a technique called strip planking, which instead of doing just three wide planks, uses strips that are basically square and they get fastened not only to the framing of the boat, but to each other. They get nailed to each other and fastened to the boat. And, but it's a lot more strips to put in. What is it? 30 per side or something? About 40 per side. <laughs> As the years go by, I'll be up to 50 probably. But here you can see the strips all going in, fairly small. Um, but it recaptures the shape of the boat and the other advantage of the strip planking is what you end up doing is building one big solid plank so it's very stiff and very strong and since the structure of this boat was so weakened and compromised it seemed like the right solution and it was going to be below the waterline where it wasn't visible as far as being from a historical standpoint.
So it, it was just deemed the best solution for the uh, for the job. So these get um, and they get steamed first, and then they have to be taken off and then put back in because you can't fasten them when you initially steam them except temporarily. So at this point, we have strip planked both sides and we have fared it and put some plane down, taken a plane and smoothed everything up and it's I'm sure the smoothest the bottom of this boat has ever been. So now that the planking is in place, remember we've got 24 broken frames and 12 rotten floor timbers. So we're going to turn it back over. Bear in mind this boat weighs, I think we calculated it to weigh about 1,600 pounds. It's solid oak. <laughs> so it was always quite the operation to turn it over. Although we got pretty good at it by the time we were done. I think we flipped it about four times. So we flipped back over right side up. And um, you can see Mr. Preston and what he's doing. Remember I talked about having the best ways to make a pattern for each of these funny shaped pieces. He's making a little on pattern and probably fine tuning it at this point. So it's like we've still got a little gap in there. So you get all your fussy work done with the patterns and then, and then you have to go find funny shaped pieces of wood again. So where are we going to do that? My friend John Swain, who I mentioned, builder of the Sultana, lives over outside of Chestertown, and he has a good stash of this, this Osage orange wood. So we took part. We ended up with 12 of these floor timber patterns. The floor timber is it's kind of the lower frame of the boat, and it has a lot of stiffness to the bottom, and it's actually bolted on, bolted through the, uh, all the way to the bottom of the keel. So we went to Chester Down, and in his backyard he had what most people would probably have supposed was a pile of firewood. But we went through this pile, it took us a couple hours, I think at least, with all of our 12 patterns, trying to find matches for these four timbers. So once we had picked out our logs, we went into the old shipyard in town, which is still there, and they still have a uh, bandsaw mill. And we sliced them up into flitches, and here you can see how the patterns are matching up with the curves of the wood. So we got our five floor timbers and took them back to St. Mary's and this is then laid out from bow to stern and you can see it kind of gives you a vision of how the shape of the boat changes. You know, pretty severe in the front, mellowing out the back and then very, I was really surprised I was able to get a single piece back for number 12. This is number 11 and 12. 11 is the only one I actually have to add a second piece to, but you still, you still got this strong grain going around the curve. And this one I'm amazed we've got out a single piece, but we did. So these get fastened in after they get cut, and again, very few straight lines, very few square corners on a boat. So here we're cutting the initial cut on the bandsaw, and then it still involves a fair bit of tweaking once you get to put it in the boat to try to get it. So here we've got wood. What is that wood? This is the Osage orange. It's um, and the reason it, you see it in a lot of curves, it was traditionally planted as hedgerows between fields because it would kind of wind and twirl and it would actually form a natural fencing. And it's, um, it's still used in some places. I even recently read articles on how you can, you can almost train it you know, as it's young. And there's a lot of it on the eastern shore that, that came out of hedgerows and it's so rock resistant that you can find a piece of it buried in the ground and it's just fine. And it is spectacularly yellow orange when you cut into it. It doesn't even look real. <coughs> it does mellow over time to kind of a honey tone, but it's, it's a nice wood to work with and, and you know, being able to find you know, these crazy shapes without having to laminate them, without having to use multiple pieces. Was, uh, it, was, it was the way I really wanted to do this job. You know, I was already strip hiking. It was a little marginally you know, non-historic, but just due to the, the circumstance. But that's, that's fresh cut. No, this had been um, cut for years. I mean, this is fresh cut from the sawmill, right, right. but it had been down for a long time. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't treat the color on this picture. <laughs> yeah. Even to me, it looks like it. But uh, yeah, when you, when you uh, first cut into it, it is just Yellowest, brightest stuff you've ever seen. So it's, a, it's a neat way to work with it. I was really glad you know, to be able to do this really the traditional way and have these nice curves. And also the incredible rock resistance of this wood. So here we are, kind of left off here, so it's like we're not quite halfway there. And 
back in the back towards the stern, you can see where we just cut off or broken off probably the, what was left of some of the rough floor timbers. What I did to keep things somewhat structural was we would do every other one so that we weren't removing all the framework at one time. So at this point we've done most of the middle stuff. Um, here you can see in the bow and done some of the more extremely shaped ones. These, uh, these notches, these holes that you see, are called limbers, and, and what they do is allow the bilge water to run far and aft and not get trapped up against any one particular frame. So you'll see that on each and every one of these. Uh, and here, here you can kind of get an idea of how the water runs back and forth along there. So in addition to the floor timbers, she had um, steam frames, and, and the frames run kind of from here up to here. And these were the ones that I talked about earlier that all broke into the spot due to the buckling and the planking. So these were made of white oak, and what we did was cook them in a steam box and then bed them into place. So I built this rig. It's just a strong oak timber with this sawtooth pattern. And then these shores, which you had to had to cut every one a little special for each frame. People wanted to do a dry fit. And so I would be in the boat and my helper would you'd steam them for about an hour. You got very little time to work with them when they come out and they're hot. So everybody's wearing gloves. He brings them in and I immediately start to flex it and work it. And then I'll take my foot and push it down into the boat. And then when I get it far enough, that's that's when these shores come into place. So they start out down at the bottom and then you, you drive them out with them all and it just perfectly takes the shape of the inside of the boat. The advantage of, uh, of steaming. Now, if you were doing the boat new, you'd have the advantage that you'd be bending a lever around the mold. But since we're going inside of planking, we had the disadvantage that we had to push that curve in from the middle. So the, the frames are actually re-sawn partway down, which means that they've got a saw cut and make them a little bit more flexible. Even with, uh, I kept this wood, I didn't even take it to the sawmill until I was like a, a few days from being ready because so I wanted it to be as green as possible. And even, even with it being that green and steam, we couldn't get that bent because we just didn't have that advantage of pulling on the lever. We were pushing the middle of the wood. So there she is, all new floor timbers, all new frames. It's overhead view. And then, as I talked about earlier, I, just, I call this the cathedral shot. We have her upside down to do uh, fastening. You can see all the shiny dots or rivets. She's fastened all with uh, copper and bronze, which means she's going to hold a lot better in, in the salt water. So the uh, frames come down alongside those four timbers, and then they're fastened four and a half with rivets to the four timbers. And they're also riveted into the planking up high, and you can fasten them into the lower framing either with nails or with screws. It's, uh, it's too small of a scale to use wooden pegs on. It's just the stuff is not that big. But we did a, I don't know how many rivets we did. It was a lot. 90. <laughs> yeah, I think it was more than that. <laughs> we put a copper shield on her keel to keep out the shipworm, the shipworm being kind of terminated to see. And now here we've got our prime upside down one more time. And this was in the fall of. So we had a rose and done at the end of the season. We wanted to try her out and see how her fares would work. And so we ended up put a primer on her. It was, it was too late in the season for fouling. So we did a bottle of bottom paint. And then, um, as I said before, and then so we're going to prime it. We're going to stain it. And it's going to look like we haven't done anything. <laughs> so, uh, so here she is. You could feel how much stiffer and stronger she was when she got to this point. It was, I, I had been on that for a long time, too. It just felt like a if you've ever been in an old house where the floor is kind of movable when you walk on, it felt kind of like that. And this was just nice and new and stiff. So she went into the water like this and put her in. And then last winter, in one of the last projects I did was we finished her up and put new, uh, new floorboards in. <laughs> At which point we cover up all, even more of that pretty work that you've just done. Yeah. Uh, and the floorboards here are the center one down the middle. In order for stiffness is oak and then um, just lap all the on the outside. So. And there she is underway. 
some of them are curved and some of them are straight, you end up working in a lot of very awkward positions. So anything you can do to make it a little more comfortable. Um, caulking on smaller vessels, like with the cotton, that will sometimes just be put in with what looks like a, um, a mini pizza wheel where it's actually kind of rolled in, where you might start with a knife and roll in. There's also I think a seamstress tool that looks like this. So when you say, a little wheel. when you say caulk too tight, does that mean too much material in the air? Mm -hmm. Shove yeah. I mean, does it absorb water too? Or? It, it absorbs water to some degree, but it, and it, you'd be amazed how tightly it will pack in there, like how much of this oakum will end up down in that seam. You might, you know, depending on the size of the seam, you might have two or three or four threads that are going So the idea is to put it in there to prevent the water from coming in, but to allow the, the wood to expand. Yeah, and the track. other thing that it does is you've got all these planks that are laying against each other, and you're essentially driving a wedge in between every single one of them, and that's making the whole thing more solid and stronger and tighter and it's the name of the ship. But yeah, it's a, it's, in some ways it's not difficult, and in some ways it's, if you, if you don't do it right, it can be bad. So you don't want to do too little, but then if you do too much, you hear, you hear stories of ships uh, spitting their oakum, where the planking is swelled enough that it pushes the oakum back out, and then you don't have anything in that little bit of steam. So I, ideally, everything is fit just so that you wouldn't need it. But, and I, some yachts, you'll see that done in, and a lot of work boats will, they'll be put together without caulking when they're new and just let the swelling take care of it. And then as the boat ages, there may come a time when you have to, have to start caulking this. And the, the amount that some wood can move is really impressive. Like on the jolly boat before we redid her, when she was dried out, you could, you could read the paper food seams.
in the old days, remember, uh, I forget exactly when the admin of Power Sheet came around, but they tried everything. They tried, in fact, we had a staff member who did some experiments where he would lay on the code of like, you know, kind of nasty stuff. Thank you. 